All right. And let's go to here and start with the schedule and then proceed to the news. All right. So we are here. Our project 13 and 14 do. Let me find out how to mute people. All right. And uh, all right. And I should also mention there are guest speakers coming. Quite a few of them have lined up. Uh, tomorrow we've got Art Jim from Cisco, a student. He's taking a lot of these classes and he's going to talk, I'm sure, about um, th identifying threat actors. That's what I see him giving talks about these days. Uh, that's what just, that's tomorrow. Uh, that's what um, he, he does a lot of tracking down who's attacking people and what tools they're using and such. And then the purple competition again this Saturday. We've had the second one last week and went very well, getting better every week. And uh, next Wednesday, a talk here, and the Wednesday after that, another talk here. So all these are worth extra credit, and uh, I recommend them. And there's a few news things to talk about. This one I thought was very interesting. And that one possibly. Um, Got a few minutes. I can take a few more. Um, that one's worth seeing. Okay, these are all pretty cool. All right. So um, let me see if I can get this thing out of the way. Never very lucky at doing that. All right. So this, I think, is an important uh, issue that comes by over and over again. If you Go to the talks at the security conventions. People always talk about the latest exciting attack that's technically complicated, but most crime doesn't use those techniques. Typically, you just use a simple technique. This is true at all levels of crime, not just cyber crime. And the most dangerous thing in the world is phishing. And I thought this was a pretty good chart. What is the thing that caused the most harm? And by far, it's phishing. Just sending fraudulent emails or people impersonating your organization by sending emails not claiming to be your organization when they aren't. Very simple human level social engineering attacks are what actually does most of the harm. And all the complicated technical things are a small part. Uh, an important thing to remember. So Julian Assange was arrested by the Brits. We, we extradited to America on almost nothing. They were going to punish him for espionage and all sorts of other major crimes, which is what they really mad at him about. But apparently, they decided to punish him only for the most minor of hacking crimes, uh, punish him for supposedly offering to help crack a password hash and then not even doing it. It sounds ridiculous, and they're trying to figure out why they charged him with so little. Uh, they say they might have charged him with this to try to get a chance to extradite him from Britain. But anyway, um, as they point out, the real point of this is probably just to benefit him. Because if they do bring him to America and charge him with something, he'll be able to demand a bunch of government documents in discovery, which he will then leak, which is what he likes to do. So he will be able to humiliate the government, which is his whole mission in life. So, you know, in general, this is sort of like when we were trying to kill Saddam Hussein, our, our government, you know, we have like a cowboy mentality, but just shooting the bad guy often makes things worse. You have to actually have a plan. What are you going to do after you get rid of the bad guy? And we keep on doing this because I think we raised on movies where all you do is punch the guy in the black hat and then you're still off into the sunset and everything's good. But the real world doesn't work that way so much. Uh, some security researcher has been finding WordPress plugin vulnerabilities, which are a dime a dozen. And he's been trying to announce them by putting them in the public forum of WordPress. And the WordPress forums forbid that. There is an official security contact where they want you to send private notification of the vulnerabilities. And for some reason, he refuses to use them. He keeps on posting them in a public forum where they delete his posts. And so he gets very, very angry at the people for censoring him. So now he's dumping them out publicly and letting people get hacked to punish them for daring to censor his posts. So uh, anyway, um, he's dumped three zero days in popular WordPress plugins and many people have been hacked and everyone is yelling at each other about this. Um, on it goes. This I thought was pretty good. So Mimi Cats is the main tool to steal passwords from RAM and 
the guy that writes, wrote it, Benjamin Delphi, is extremely energetic at updating it. And every time Microsoft brings out any new defense, he immediately hacks through it in the next day or two. So Microsoft has come out with Windows Server 2019. And by the way, you can put up Server 2019 domain controllers for free on the Google Cloud right now. I saw them there. And um, not that it's probably that exciting. But anyway, he, um, he found how to bypass the password policy. So if you go into... Um, uh, let's say it's really not big enough. I don't see any way to make it bigger. Right click seems to do nothing. Um, double click does nothing. Anyway, um, the, the point is if you try to um, log in with a domain controller, it has a password complexity policy. It has to be long, it has to have uppercase and lowercase. And he is able to, if you have a mini cats, you can run, you can just turn off the password policy and have a single word password. And let me see if there's any way to make this thing there. There's a way to make it bigger. Good. All right. Um, so, you can change the server domain control, um, change the user to sample, and he can do all the good stuff. He can change the password to something that violates the password policy. He can change the password without knowing your existing password. He can just do all sorts of great stuff. And, he, and Mimi Katz does a ton of these things. More of that coming up later. Anyway, um, so Google Cloud has these things called shielded VMs, which sound very good. You, if you want, you can have a normal virtual machine on the cloud, or you can pay more and use a shielded VM. And the shielded VM has a whole series of verifications during boot up. As every part of the component loads, it checks the hash and makes sure it's right. So nobody's been putting root kits or other malware in it. It sounds very good. And then it does integrity monitoring, which sounds sort of like what Tripwire does. So it will know if anybody's hacking in and modifying your page and so on. It sounds pretty good. Uh, might be good to play with and see how good it really is. Um, this, I've been uh, trying to develop some antivirus evasion labs. This is probably what we're going to do in the next um, purple competition. And so I went online and I found that this tool is what someone recommends for this, is don't kill my cat. What he did was he found out that you can put executable code inside images and they're still valid images because bitmaps, the only thing you have to have in a bitmap is BM at the start. And it turns out that the ASCII code BM is harmless assembly language. Now, you could have something horrible there, but it's not. It's 4D42, that's BM, or MB or something. And um, here's the point, BM is there, and BM is increment EDX and decrement EBP. And those are relatively harmless assembly language commands. You can just add more assembly language after them to cancel them out. They're not going to cause an exception or anything. So you can totally execute code that starts with those commands. And so you can have a perfectly valid image that is also perfectly valid assembly code. And that's what his tool does. His, this tool, he wrote a tool that will encode assembly code in the images. And then upload the images and then run it in the images. And this apparently evades antivirus like a champ, as you might imagine. Because the antivirus just perceives it as images. So it's very cute. And so I'm hoping we'll have that. Yeah. Anyway, um, I'm working on that. Here's another one, ways to bypass detection. This is one I know I can do, and we'll play with it. Um, the one sim the very common technique is dill injection. Um, typically, antivirus only detects code if you run it. You're, I did this with Python years ago. You can load a block of data that contains malware, and your antivirus will not go off because it's not executed. It just sees it as static data. Then you execute it in some other way, and it won't be caught. And you can do it with dill injection too. You can load malware as a dill, which is just a library, and then separately launch it with another process. And this way, both of those activities will be perceived as harmless by the antivirus. You won't be able to put the two pieces together. And we'll see how well that really works. Because both of these techniques, that one has been around for years. And presumably at some point, antivirus will actually update their stuff to where they detect it. But it hasn't happened yet. Anyway. Today, I, the chapter is very short, and it won't take long, so I'm going to add something else that comes from news that I got interested in lately and developed a lecture on. I've got lectures and cahoots about this, because this is pretty important and very interesting, and it really summarizes a lot of security, um, a lot of security information I thought was very good. This is Triton. This is an attack that just, this is, because Kaspersky gave this talk at, I think, Black Hat in Singapore a couple days ago. And they issued a white paper about this. Um, no, pardon me, not Kaspersky, FireEye, which is Mandiant. Um, it wouldn't be Kaspersky because this is, in fact, um, a military activity from the Russians. So they wouldn't be spilling the beans on it. 
but the Americans are spilling the beans, FireEye. And so this is the most dangerous malware in the world, they say. This is the malware that was used to attack Saudi Arabian oil refineries, and the purpose was to take over the industrial control systems, and the main thing they did was turn off the safety modules to try to physically destroy the plant, like a bomb. Or at least that was the result. It might have been what they intended, and it might have been an accident, but they turned off the safety systems, and uh, the, end, the end result was that it caused a uh, unexpected shutdown of the entire plant. It did not cause anybody to get killed, but it certainly could have. And this, by the way, like almost every major cyber attack, came from the Americans, ultimately in the following sense. We performed the um, Stuxnet attack against Iran in conjunction with Israel. <coughs> and when that came out, and no one should ever have known about it. It was supposed to be a military attack. It was supposed to be concealed, but they made a mistake. So the malware spread, and it went to other machines that weren't involved and got caught by antivirus. Yeah. What's that? Uh, I don't know. Uh, they said it spread too far, yeah? Yeah, no, that's exactly what happened. They made it stupid. They were worried that it wasn't affecting the computers. Yeah. And um, so they ran that the malware and then they had to get rid of it. Yeah. So they ramped up the ability for it to spread and just spread too far, too fast, and just cut up. Yes, and there was another one deployed against Saudi Arabia that used wiper that you would infect machines and then wipe the hard drive completely, totally destroying them on the way out. And there's a few of these to try to remove all forensic evidence. That's another way to do it. But in all in the ones that we know about, there were a series of attacks like this. The ones we know about are the ones that had a defect of some kind, so they got caught. Um, and so but when this came out that we had done this, a lot of the civil liberties people said, do you really shouldn't have done that? You've opened Pandora's box. You started this world of cyber attacks, destroying physical hardware. And the problem is America has most of the hardware, so we're gonna be suffering from this. We're in a guy in glass houses throwing stones. But anyway, for better or worse, we're now in the middle of a raging cyber warfare. Every nation is hacking everybody else like crazy. And all the people getting infected with spam and viruses are the people getting hit by the shrapnel of this massive war going on uh, from the military agents. And so um, this is why they say this is, this could have led to a lethal catastrophic accident and unfortunately just shut down the plant in Saudi Arabia in 2017. <coughs> and now they're back again. Yeah? Um, I don't know. They don't tell us how they found out. Of course, a lot of this is essentially military and industrial secrets. Eventually, they called in Mandiant. Mandiant was called in, and now they've received approval to release some information about it. So this is one thing to remember. Everything you see is the tip of the iceberg. Most of it is behind non-disclosure agreement and probably behind military secrecy. You're seeing what little bit has been approved by committees of people to be released. So there's probably a lot more that they know that they can't tell us. So, and it's very interesting, I think, to see what attacks they use because they're all the same stuff that we use in class here. They took the standard attack tools like Mimi Cats and PS Exec. Mimi Cats is the tool I just showed you before. This is the way you steal credentials from RAM on Windows machines. It's very powerful and wonderful. And they took PS Exec and all they did was modify them a little bit so antivirus won't catch them, which is what we're gonna start doing on the Purple Team on, on this week. Um, it's very easy to do. There was a contest a few years ago at DEF CON to modify viruses to get them past antivirus. And of course, it's very easy. Antivirus is a very weak defense. It's like a three-foot hall fence. It stops some attackers, but anybody that has any strength punches right through it. So they created custom tools that will evade the security technology. And they do the same thing as Mimi Cats and PS Exec. PS Exec is a Microsoft product to launch processes on a remote system with credentials. So once you've stolen credentials with Mimi Cats, you can launch processes with PS Exec. But if you don't want to have the antivirus detect it, then you modify them slightly. Um, and these, this is not specific to Saudi Arabia. They have also attacked North America and Europe and many American companies because um, it has been attributed to the Russians. And so logically, it will attack all the people the Russians don't like. So that is the uh, non-technical article from Wired Magazine. This is the official technical white paper from FireEye. The people have found this stuff, and this is the real fundamental um, uh, information on which it's all based. So the point of this is to manipulate industrial safety systems, and they have led to a, gov a government-owned research institute. Um, they attribute it. This is attribution. This is one thing you do whenever you analyze malware and attacks. You try to figure out who did it. Now, Typical private companies don't care who did it. Generally, what does it do you any good if you're like 
Kodak. Why do you care whether you're being hacked by an American or a Russian or Chinese? It doesn't matter who they are. You're not going to go punch them in the nose. You just want to put on some defenses and protect yourself. The only people that care who they are is the police and the military and law enforcement, people that think they can actually do something about it. Um, but anyway, these um, the large multinational corporations are closely tied to the government and people who run critical national infrastructure like oil plants and aircraft control towers and stuff are closely tied to the Department of Homeland Security in America and such, and they are strongly motivated to find out who did it because they will take government action against them. So that's why the um, major consultants like Mandiant that you bring in to analyze networks will try to attribute it, and they will try to analyze the addresses used and the techniques and the malware and everything else used to attribute, to perform attribution. This is highly controversial. Uh, you may remember a few years ago, there was a movie making fun of North Korea, and then there was an attack on Sony. And the US government came out and said that was North Korea that did that attack, and various other people came out and said it wasn't North Korea. And the US government said at that time, we aren't gonna release the evidence, so a lot of people remained unconvinced until a few years later when there, some evidence came out and convinced almost everybody that it really was North Korea. But this is what happens. You, It's like, uh, police work where you take fingerprints and blood spatters and you try to figure out who did it. It's complicated and not perfect. And um, people can usually argue, especially since in most cases they're unwilling to release the actual evidence because it's uh, considered confidential. So many people argue um, about who really did it. Anyway, this is a uh, the threat life cycle, which I think came from Lockheed Martin originally. This is a good thing to know. This is how tax work. This is how the CNET 123 textbook goes through it. This is a standard thing. You have an initial compromise. Um, this is the uh, kill chain, people call this these days. It's a more modern way to look at it. So you trick, you get some compromise of some system on the network. Almost always you do this by phishing, just like the previous news article is saying. This is the easiest way to get in any network. You send a bunch of emails. Somewhere in the company, somebody clicks on a link or runs the attachment. Now you have some ability to execute code on one machine. Typically what you have is non-administrator access to an unimportant machine like one person's laptop. So the next thing is to have some kind of foothold on that machine. You put on some kind of persistent machine. Uh, establish a backdoor account or something, then you try to escalate your privileges. You try to get up to administrator privileges on that machine so you can install malware, and you try to get domain administrator privileges so you can take over the domain. And that is often very easy, one, because there are a lot of things that make this easy. One of the simplest things is almost everybody deploys Windows with images, like Norton Ghost. So they have one golden image, and every laptop is a clone of the golden image, and they all have exactly the same administrator password. So once you steal the administrator password out of this machine, it'll work on any other machine. This is a common side effect of the modern way to deploy Windows. So once you've got higher privileges, now you start scanning inside the network to see what else you can find. The main controller, the email server, the industrial control systems, the security cameras, whatever you've got, and then you move and take over other systems and establish more and more footholds, more and more malware backdoors, so that even if they find this, they can still not kick you out. And then once you've taken over a lot of machines and you have a lot of footholds, then you try to complete your mission, which will be typically um, taking down systems you don't like and often stealing information. This all started with the Chinese. The Chinese started doing this around 2005. And it was an inside secret in the business. And it officially announced at that time they had a plan to make the new China. And the plan was to steal American technology so they wouldn't have to invent it. They would steal our proprietary technology and use it to rebuild China. And they did that. And everyone kept it secret in America until 2010 when Google felt personally wounded by the Chinese hacking them because they had just expanded into China and they saw the Chinese to a partner. When they found out Google China was hacking them, they felt stabbed in the back and they kicked over the bucket and they announced publicly that China was hacking them. And that made it known, but they'd been doing it for a long time. And they had really done, all they wanted was information and they would sneak in your network and put malware on it so you would not tell they were there at all. They would very sneakily sneak out the data mixed in the other data and live there for years. And they would have persistence mechanisms that would do nothing and wake up later. And they had persistence mechanisms that would wait as long as three years before waking up and infecting you again. So even when you think you've cleaned it off, three years later it wakes up and puts them back under the control of China because they really wanted to keep permanent inside connections inside the network so they could just keep on stealing your proprietary data forever. And they were the first case 
of the advanced resistant threat that started this, and all the other, many other nations are now doing the same thing. And they've developed over the last five or six years efficient intrusion uh, incident response systems to cope with this stuff. It's expensive, but now it's possible. Six years ago, it wasn't possible for any amount of money to stop these guys. Now it can be done, but it's quite a job. So here's a list of the tools that they used in the various life cycle stages. So SecHack is a tool for credential harvesting, and they gave it this name, KB777. KB stands for Knowledge Base, and the reason they did that is because Windows Update files look like this. Windows Update files are named KB and then a number for which Windows Update they are. So you give it a name like this, and everybody will probably not worry about it and just think it's Windows file. Here's um, PSExec changed to NetExec. Here's CryptCat based backdoor. This document did not say so, but I'm assuming this is based on the CryptoCat chat client, which is one of the popular open source encrypted chat methods. Almost all attacks are slightly modified, semi-legitimate tools. A lot of people use things like, um, uh, there's a remote, popular remote control client, uh, the name I can't remember, TeamViewer. A lot of them use TeamViewer. They modify it a little bit, put it in malware, and so on. PLink is another backdoor to get on the system. And Bitvice is yet another. Here's OpenSSH. They use various OpenSSH variants to get on. And here's web shells. Uh, these are like the PHP shells that we've had, although these are Windows variants. And here, they took Microsoft Outlook web access components that lets you access email on the web and slightly modify them and give them names to make them look like legitimate access, access um, files. This is the original Mimi Cats stealing administrator passwords from memory. And this is SecHack. You can see it's almost exactly the same thing. They just took Mimi Cats and changed it a little bit. That's all they have because they don't really want to change its functionality. They just want it to be a little bit different so any virus won't catch it. So their main our goal here was concealment, which is generally true for advanced resistant threat. The less dangerous type of attacker, like criminals that just want to steal credit card numbers, is called smash and grab. They just get in, steal a bunch of stuff, leave, break machines, get caught, they don't care, they're gone. But the nation states with advanced persistent threat, that's what the word means, they want to come in and they want to persist on your network, so they want to sneak in, so you don't see them coming in, you don't know they're there, they don't break anything, they don't set off any alarms, and they just stay there forever like a spy, doing something small, but important to the nation state. And so these guys were trying to do that, so they were hiding on the network, doing a, setting slowly crawling their way through, setting on all this malware, and using encrypted tunnels so you wouldn't recognize the network traffic as being your secrets leaving or commands coming in. They had many staging folders. They deleted their trail. Their tools changed the names so that they wouldn't leave any suspicious traces behind. No, they're, they're not messing around, and they used time stomping. Microsoft Windows, and also Linux for that matter, has a whole series of timestamps. There are four main timestamps at every file. They call it MACE modified, access, created, and executed, four times on every file. And the time you see, if you just right-click a file and go to properties, is just one of those. And in fact, there's no easy command to change those dates. You're not supposed to be able to change them. And so there are tools called time stompers that will change all those timestamps. This is real important because when you, the way, the way you do instant response is you finally something happens that catches your attention, like a virus goes off or something somewhere in your company, and you take that to your instant response team and they say, okay, where did this come from? And then they try to look at the network traffic and the server logs and everything to find out how that got there, and they look for incidents in that time range. So if you can change the time, you can really hide their ability to track you down. And the other reason why you want to do time stomping is because this is a big part of attribution. Um, once they find malware, they look at the time that malware was compiled. And Kaspersky does this all the time. They look at the time it was compiled and they figure out what time zone it was made in because they figure that was between nine and five in the local time zone. That's how they tell Chinese malware from American malware. And so anyway, altering the timestamp is important. And if you don't alter it, you will find that all the pieces of malware that came from the same attack tool were all compiled within the same couple of seconds of each other. So it's very clear that they're all part of the same attack. And you probably would like to conceal that. So they got in onto the control system. Then they attached the, uh, the industrial control system network. And they, again, tried to hide what they were doing. Another common trick is that they did all their activities out of normal work times. They did not do it in whatever was 9 to 5 in the time zone of their target network, but late at night. This is what Gary McKinnon, the UFO hacker, did. He got into inside the NSA. He found a Windows XP machine running with no password and remote registry turned on. So you could just connect with the IP address and have administrator privileges on the box. 
and he went and used that box only at night for two years. And he said he saw the Russians and the Chinese and North Korea and everybody just going in there sweeping through the NSA for years. And they were fine until somebody finally used it in the daytime. And somebody was walking by seeing the mouse move and windows open. And that's how they finally noticed that everybody has been prowling through their network for years. Um, so anyway, they, people try to avoid the daytime for that reason. And they again tried to uh, name their files to make them look legitimate. Like Schneider Electric is the ICS vendor. I guess this is... Um, also true of the attack we did against Iran, we targeted their vendors' products. I mean, it was a German vendor, and we had the uh, we knew exactly what model numbers had been given to Iran, so we knew which model numbers to attack. So anyway, um, here's what you can do to protect yourself: you could try to clean malware off the industrial control systems, but industrial control systems like Internet of Things devices are simple devices. They don't really have any antivirus. It's hard to get on them. It is far more effective to try to stop the attack before it reaches them. You would like to stop it before it reaches them anyway. So the logical place to stop it is on the Windows machines. They have to infect the Windows machine. Then they use the Windows machine to infect the ICS. And the Windows machine is where you normally have logs and antivirus and all these tools to help you. So this is where you typically want to focus your defense attacks and defense efforts, and that's what we're going to do. And here's some of the things you'll find. You'll find scheduled tasks. Scheduled tasks are what Microsoft gives you to do automatic tasks. You'll find um, the extra scheduled tasks there very often because it's a way for malware authors to achieve persistence. So that even when you think you cleaned it off, something wakes up later and phones back home. Um, you got other techniques here, um, registry entries, and hard-coded DNS servers. You will typically find domain names, IP addresses of the command and control server, and DNS entries, because that has to, that's how it knows who to phone home to. Um, you watch going out to reports. I was really quite surprised to find that an intelligent, sophisticated attacker like the Russian is using port 4444. 4444 is the default interpreter shell in Metasploit. I would think you would not use that. I thought that was an amateur move, but apparently they're using it, which surprised me. Traffic going to that is an obvious red flag. Script kiddies use that. Um, they have VPS infrastructure, your virtual private servers. This is what everybody does, including me. You just get cloud servers. I put them in a the Google Cloud. I put them on DigitalOcean. That's what attackers do. You just rent a cloud machine. You use that for your command and control center. That is the simplest, easiest way to do it. Then you've got a machine you can use, and if they catch it and shut it down, who cares? You can just rent another one. Um, Look for domains that are newly observed, not real domains being used for purpose with long names, names with hyphens. Uh, this is a very common trick, and I've got some projects uh, I'm using, I'll probably use them next time I teach DNS security here, where we practice, um, have simulations of DNS uh, tunneling. Because once you have, you're trying to sneak data out of a network after you hack it, you have to sneak it out somehow, and one common technique is in DNS requests because every company has to let DNS requests go out to find out where people are. And so you can have long domain names that are not real, but go to a server and they look like domain names to your network traffic, but they'll have long names, often random names. So you can find DNS sites that are registered with a free register like afraid.org and so on, or the funny email address. Those are all clues that these are not real domains being used by a real company, but fake domains set up just to pass a cursory inspection, like a sloppy fake ID that a teenager is using to get into a bar. It looks a little bit like a real domain, but if you take a look at how it's really being used, it's obvious that it's not a real website. And then RDP. RDP is the um, Microsoft Remote Control System that's built into Windows machines. It's what Microsoft administrators use all the time. And RDP traffic is blocked on many networks. It's blocked on our network, so you have to tunnel it over another protocol. And they use this thing called P-Link. You can also use SSH to tunnel it out, or you can use direct RDP if the network allows you. And um, then we'll see, you might compromise VPN accounts. This is what happened in the target attack, I think. Um, they got real VPN credentials because you get on somebody's laptop, then you escalate to administrator on a the laptop, then you get their VPN credentials. Now you connect into the company network with legitimate employees VPN credentials, so you're not going to set off any red flags. Now any company that doesn't want to get hacked should have knocked this off years ago and switched to two-factor authentication because any kind of single factor is too easy to steal. They should be using two-factor, but if you're using two-factor, then they might redirect the phone calls somewhere else for the SMS base. So this would be one trick, is to detect that the SMS 
phone numbers are not in your normal country. So they've redirected it to go somewhere else. Anyway, um, here's CryptCat. CryptCat has a default password, Metallica. You might see that if they haven't even bothered to modify that. And time stomping by PowerShell is used. Um, Visual Studio is used. And here's favorite directories to put files in and run them. You can search for data here. This most uh, antivirus logs will tell you about this stuff. So anyway, those are the techniques that were used. And one thing you see at the end of every one of these analysis reports is the indicators of compromise. Um, this is the end result. This is the most useful information in most threat analysis reports because you feed this into your endpoint solution like uh, Norton or McAfee or Carbon Black or, and it scans your network for just these hashes and that tells you if you've been infected by these things. Um, these hash-based detections are very popular because most antivirus, now the problem with hash-based detection is if you modify the file at all, the hash will change. So it is very easy to evade this kind of detection. This is only going to tell you if you got exactly the same file somebody else got. The reason it's popular is because you have a low false positive rate. You will not trigger this alert on an innocent file. Only the exact file will trigger it. So if an alarm goes off, that means you really have a problem. Most people are very, very annoyed by false positives. If the antivirus goes off on an innocent file, you waste everybody's time running around and they really don't want that to happen. So they go to the other extreme and make something that will never trigger unless it's sure you've been hacked. And that may not be what you really want at your company, but that is what will happen if you use these hash-based signatures. And so I put the links here in case anybody wants to refer to them. And I've got some cahoots about that stuff, which are worth six points today because there's more of them than usual. So we'll see if people can remember any of that stuff. But that is basically a summary of the whole instant response class and the goal of the hacking class to do that stuff. So I thought it was very useful and uh, decided it was worth adding to this class. I guess that's an appropriate amount of noise. Let me bring up a file to save the winners in. Okay. 4.15. All right. <laughs> Good. All right. We got nine. I'll wait to see. We got six online and about eight in the room. There might be a few more joining. I'll wait a few more seconds. Ah, thought so. That's you. Good. Anybody else coming? All right. I guess we'll carry on. Okay. So, how many people have been killed by Triton? Nobody yet. Nobody has died. There were some people killed by Stuxnet um, in the sense that the Iranian government got so angry that their ice stop separators kept breaking that they began executing their own scientists thinking they were sabotaging them. And when they figured it out, um, the Israelis sent spies on a motorcycle with limpet bombs to blow up the cars and kill those scientists that had figured it out to make it continue working. So Various people do die in these operations, but as far as I know, nobody died yet from the Triton attacks. So what is the Triton actor's top priority? The main goal is to hide. All right. Who is doing it?
Oh, thought it ran in there twice. That's a mistake. Oh well. One of them should have been North Korea. But anyway, it was Russia doing it. All right. What's the next step after you establish a foothold in the kill chain? You have to escalate privileges. Once you have some ability, you have to get up to administrator and hopefully domain administrator, and then you can move around and take over more boxes. What's the point of a name like that? That's it. Windows updates have file names like that. All right, what tool steals credentials from RAM? Good, clean fun. Right, that's of course Mimi Cats, which I think is named after a cartoon character in France, but I'm not sure. Anyway. So what's Microsoft's tool to administer servers? RDP, Remote Desktop Protocol, which by the way, is a limited licensed version of Citrix. Uh, Microsoft is like the Frankenstein monster. They don't write so much code as they buy companies and patch it together. And this they got from Citrix. But anyway, that's their tool, Remote Desktop Protocol. All right, why do people use hashes for indicators of compromise? Okay. Low false positives, that's the benefit of it. If you see that hash, that really proves to a high degree of certainty that you've seen exactly that product. All right, so these are the winners. Attack on Triton will have to tell me who they are. That's you, okay, good. Um, what's your name? Marshall. Marshall, okay. That's probably good enough, good. So you folks get six points, good, all right. And Caitlin, all right. And Caitlin really needs those points, all right, Tony, the, uh, all right, so, um, all right, so, uh, you know, a little bit of this talk about logic, this is the kind of stuff that doesn't really lend it to cahoots, but all right, well, I wanted to demonstrate this challenge, which I think is good, clean, fun, um, so let's take a look at that. If I bring up Burp, which is running here, and I go to my options, it's listening on 127.001, which is fine because I'm not trying to hook up an Android device or anything. I'm just going to use this. Um, this Firefox right here and I put on the uh, Foxy proxy plugin. So it's very easy to send it to BERT. So now it's going through BERT. So if I go to ad.samsclass.info. Okay, then I should see in BERT, I should see some traffic. And if I go to HTTP history, let me clean this out of the way. Okay, and if I go to the bottom, I see ad.sam slash study info. So let me delete all this old stuff, clear history. Okay, and for this project, I go to, by the way, I cleaned this page up a little, but I left a link to Caitlin's hack version here. Anyway, so um, let's go to SAML, SAMLOL.sam's class study info. And I don't know what this nonsense is talking about. Um, neat. Um, that would be sort of interesting to find out why. Perhaps this is because of the bad security. Ah, it's the SSL it doesn't like, right. So I wanted to go to the non-SSL version so we wouldn't have to put up with this nonsense. That's interesting. Firefox seems to have changed their warning and made it more alarming, which is probably an attempt to improve security and not necessarily a bad thing. So this, anyway, um, 
So here's the page I want to go to, HTTP, samlol.samscholastudinfo, and Firefox should not complain about that. So here we are at sp.samsclass.info. Now this is the way real authentication is done by, for example, Canvas and many other systems. Yeah. Uh, normally, that's a very good question. Most sites should not have a non-secure page. They should only have a secure page. Unfortunately, your website is redirects back to Well, my website has both a secure and an insecure version just so we can practice testing. A good website should have only a secure version. The most common situation, unfortunately, is they do have an insecure version, and it does a 302 redirect to the secure version. So normal people end up on the secure version, but that means you can hack them by catching up the insecure step. Um, so the best thing is to just have HTTPS and not have an HTTP page at all. How do you go back? You go up here and type in the URL starting with HTTP. That's essentially what I did. I went and found a link that was to HTTP only. So then you can go to the HTTP page if they're serving it. You look like I'm not answering your question. Okay, because like on your website, when I just do the S on HTTPS, it just redirects back. Right. That's my main website is set up the way most of them are. So if you go to samsclass.info, it goes to HTTPS, and if you go to HTTP, it will just go back to HTTPS. That is the way most people have got it set up in order to make it more secure for normal people. Um, but my attack server, I set up with two URLs, one that goes to insecure, one that goes to secure, just so we can true it both ways. Good. But it's not, so, not that that's a recommended practice. It's just for our convenience so we can do things like catch traffic and wire shot. All right. So here we are. This is loading a service provider. So now you can log in here. So right now you have an account, user1 PWD. So I can hit log in. And then I can put in user1 and pwd, and I will log in. And this is using a common SAML library. So now I have logged in as user1. Now it's going to tell me I'm not winning because I'm not the administrator yet, but I have gotten as user1. And let's look at how that happened. You can see it here in BERT. The way it worked was I tried to go to the service provider, SP. The service provider said, I don't know who you are, and sent me back to the identity provider. This is the way almost all the web works. If you try to log in someplace, they will say, oh, you have to log in, but you don't log in here. You log in with Facebook or LinkedIn or something, because almost nobody really wants the responsibility of maintaining a database of passwords, and why should they? Everybody logs in Facebook anyway. So you're at the service provider, but the service provider sends you to a different system, the identity provider, and then you come back with proof that you're in. That's, this is the most common way it's done. So this is the service provider, and the, reason, the way we're going to hack in is based on this logic. The service provider is typically a small, unprofessional company, and they outsource their identification to a big company that's professional, like Facebook. Say, so log in with Facebook and then come back. So you're probably not going to find a bug on the identity provider, but the service provider might be running lousy, crappy code that they can't set up correctly, which is commonly the case. So what we're going to do here is exploit an error on the service provider side. Yeah, it goes to the identity provider, and the identity provider provides the uh, collects the login. So if I go here, here's my login request. And if I look down here, let me make my window go up a bit. All right, so there's my login request, login.php. So if you look at my request down here, um, well, again, I thought I expected to see the passwords down here, but somehow I am not. Um, maybe it's on the next one. Yeah, here's the identity provider, and there's the raw request. And I still expected to see the passwords. Let me, um, someplace around here, there. This is the one that went in. Okay, this is the request that sent the username and password up, user1 and pwd. That went to the service provider. And the service provider then uh, sent me over to the uh, identity provider. So at some point after that, I should have gone to the identity provider. Let me go to my project instructions. Somehow I'm falling off the track here. Um, all right. Um, I want to see the service provider, then three IDPs, and then the SP. So I'm just going to get a clean case because somehow I've got junk here that's confusing me. All right. Let's go here. And log out and then go back to login user one and PWD. 
All right, now I'm ready to log in. I'm gonna clear all this and see if I can get a nice clean trace that shows what I want you to see. All right, now I've logged in. So, what I, here's what, now we're on track. So here I am post-sending my username and password to the identity provider. Here's what the identity provider sends back. They send me a response, and the response has this gigantic blog of Base64 junk in it called SAML response. That is my ID card. All this junk down here is contains the proof that I'm really, after name and password are good, that's my ID card. So now I go back to the service provider, and when I send a request there, I send them that huge SAML response. You'll see it here in the raw thing. You send that to them. Here's the ID card I got. And the service provider will now believe that that tells you who I am. To understand this, you can put on the burp extension SAML Raider. You can also just copy this and put it in Python or unbase64 it and see what it is. This is just base64 encoded text. But SAML Raider does that for you automatically. So the reason why this turned purple is because SAML Raider has detected it has SAML in it. SAML is security assertion markup language. And so this, is, this contains code which makes a security assertion. And this right here is the assertion right at the bottom. It is an XML document claiming some security things. And in particular, it has a signature. Um, it has a series of signatures. Here's things about algorithms. Here's a signature value. It has these long base 64 encoded signatures and certificates, which are cryptographic proof that I, I, whatever I'm saying is true with several signatures. And down here is what is signed. And what is signed is a claim about who I am. And here is the claim, I am user one. So this big blob of base 64 decodes into this long statement that says my ID card. I am user one, here's my email and so on. And this signature is what proves it. So the job of the service provider is to check the signature, and if the signature is correct, then believe I'm user one, let me see user one's stuff, which is what happens here. As you saw, I saw user one's page here. So the question is, can I trick it? Now, I might want to try to edit it here, but all this stuff is grayed out because I'm on the history tab, and you can't change history. If you want to change anything, you have to catch it on the fly before it goes. So I'm going to go back to here. And I'm going to log out and then log in again. And this time I'm going to capture the login and modify it. All right, so I'm ready to log in again. Now I go to intercept and turn on intercept. Now I log in and the first request is intercepted, but this request is the one going to the identity provider to get the identity card. So I don't want to intercept this one. I want to let this one go forward. The second one is the one that has this SAML signature, which you see down here. This is the one I want to modify. So now I can modify it on the way out. So suppose I try this. I'll just change my name to admin. Now maybe they don't verify the certificate at all, and they just believe whatever they're told. That would be nice. So now I, I stop intercepting, and we'll see what happens. And what happens is I get an exception. So it won't fall for that. It does notice that that signature does not match the data, something bogus is happening here, and then I didn't write a very good website, it just has the default error message. But anyway, I got busted. I didn't get away with that. So let's try this again. I log out, and now I log in again with my only valid account I know, user one and password. There's a user two, but I don't care because that's not an administrator either. Now I'm gonna intercept this one. So turn on intercept, log in, now go back to BERT. This is the request to get the ID card. I want to let that one through. Here's the request at the ID card. So let's try this. Notice all this cryptographic signature stuff up here, which busted me. What would happen if I remove the signatures? Now they're gone. I could send a claim that does not have signatures. Now this is quite common, and this happened to some of my automatically graded projects where an empty field is interpreted as okay because the logic was, a mis was mistakenly encoded. Now, let's see if I can change my name to administrator, admin. And then stop intercepting. And now when I go back here, I win. Because a missing signature is interpreted as a valid signature. This is much easier to do than you would think. Um, so that's, that's that thing, and you get to see the reason why this pro product, SAML Raider, exists is because about five years ago, a research paper came out and they analyzed all 14 of the existing 
SAML libraries, and about 11 of them had these vulnerabilities. It was just amazing. Uh, this is true of almost every generation of security products. The first generation of them is incredibly bad. Like the first generation of encrypted USB sticks, 90% of them were not encrypted. All they did was put software on them that launched when you plugged them into a Windows machine that asked you for a password. And they wouldn't open the folder unless you put in the password. But if you plugged them into a Linux machine, you could just copy all the data off them. So they weren't really making you very safe. The iron key, which was more expensive, was really encrypted. The rest were just password protected, but not really encrypted. So you really have to check your security products with a suspicious eye, uh, because very often, they are doing far less than you might think they're doing to protect you. Anyway, so I wanted to show you that one. And um, there's another one here. I guess I'll mention as we're going live, we've got the time. This is um, PHP fail. So let me go back to here and go to um, attack. Okay, and then PHP fail is here. And there's another one at the bottom. I want to show you this one. I thought this was pretty interesting. Um, so in here, the, this is a message board where you can post things. And the um, message board operator wants to remove certain text. So they use this thing called preg replace, regular expression replace. It's a PHP function that lets you take anything with secret and remove it. And it looks harmless, but it's not harmless because if you have metadata, if you have active commands in the data that's being replaced, it executes them, which is not obvious at all. I've also gotten burned by ridiculous things in PHP. PHP usually means you get hacked because PHP has a lot of trapdoors like this that hurt you. So if I put up a message here saying hello and post it, it posts the message hello. It cleans it and put a hello up there, so that's all right. But if I put in secret and post, then it cleans it and it doesn't put secret there, it removes the word secret. That was the software operating as intended. Unfortunately, the preg replace function lets you put in metadata so you can do this. You can put in secret and then a system command to execute ls. And when it removes it, it will execute the metadata inside there. So now when I post it, it will clean it and the result of cleaning will be to dump out the ls. It will execute the code while cleaning it. This is because it, if you have metadata in there, it has to resolve it to a value and then look to see if you have the forbidden word in there. This is like the back ticks in a bash command line. This, and a lot of people don't know this. They write what looks like innocent code and it has command injection when they didn't do anything like take a parameter and intentionally put it in a command. So anyway, that's a fun one. You can get burned a lot by these things. So that's, so that's the yes, because it has to resolve the stuff in curly braces to find out what it is to then see if the bad word is in there. It's like, um, it's like the bash command line. You have the same thing here. If I go to my bash command line, if I do echo one, that's fine. If I do echo date, it will just echo the word date. But if I do echo backtick date, then it will execute the command date to figure out what, is, what you, it should echo. So that's what those curly braces do. They're meta command that refer to ls, and it has to do the ls to see what it should do with it. So now it will block an ls that finds a file named secret, which might be what you want, but in this case, that is not what was wanted. And this is what happens when you have multiple passes through the system, one pass to resolve the external entities, then another pass to execute the code that's left. Um, and that is essentially the problem with the web, is you have many servers that keep reprocessing the data that has been changed by the server before it. And that's why you can get away with such murder. Anyway, I also mentioned this one is awesome. Hacker 101 CTF just had a post last couple days ago. This is a lot of fun. I've been playing with this. I highly recommend it. If you do some of these, they're worth extra credit. I've had a lot of fun with this. They have an encrypted paste bin. I've got about halfway through cracking. They've got some nice blind SQL injections. It's good, clean fun. Anyway, um, so let's talk about logic flaws. And just like in that Triton attack, and in the news article before it, I said the number one flaw is just humans making mistakes and tricking them in by sending them emails and stuff. It turns out that the most common, or one huge problem on the web is not technical. It is you didn't think this through. For example, in one of the other classes, there's a application people are hacking into that does not resolve passwords on the server. It resolves passwords on the client. 
it takes the password from the server and puts it on the client. And that is the comparison here, which is insane, but that's a logic flaw error. You should send the password to the server. The server should compare the password and then tell you if it's right or not. The San Francisco parking meters did the same thing. You put in the card and the meter asks the card, do you have enough money? It's the card doesn't ask the meter, do I have enough money? So I can just make a card that always says yes and have all the money I want. So anyway, this is the same kind of thing. This is not a logic technical flaw where you're going to find a signature. It is a, when you haven't thought things through. There's another example. There's a product you can buy, a USB thumbprint reader. Now, a lot of Macs and PCs now have fingerprint readers, but when they didn't, about seven years ago, you could buy a USB fingerprint reader, and they all work like this. You put your thumbprint on it, it would compare it to a stored thumbprint, and if it's right, it would then type your password in. So this thing means the driver for that product has to have your password in plain text to type it in. So it lowers the security of the entire system back down to MS-DOS before Windows 95. Microsoft hasn't stored plain text passwords in 20 years because that's insane, but this product has to by its design. So they should have caught that in the design stage. Wait a minute, it's gonna have the password. Wait, you have to redesign this, that can't be right. But that was the way to make it interoperable. So you can plug it in a Mac or a PC. It just types your password in for you, just like the um, rubber ducky, where you plug it in the USB port and it types in things. That, of course, will be easy to use, and they hope no one notices what they just did to your security model. Anyway, so that's what these kind of flaws are like. So here's real examples. So here's a remember me. If you click the remember me on a website and you log in, it typically sets a persistent cookie. Now the cookie might, have, can, could, might be an encrypted string that contains your name and user ID and other things. Um, that's what this one did. And then it saved your screen name. So the idea is you're okay because it's encrypted and you can't crack the encryption. You might like to think there's a private key and it's only on the server or something. But the problem is it used the same encryption routine for this high value stuff which is your authentication, and for this low value stuff, which is your screen name, and you control the screen name. So what you can do is the app, in order to display your screen name, it decrypts the encrypted screen name stored in a cookie and puts it on the screen. So there is a function available to decrypt, which I can control. So all I have to do is take the remember me cookie and copy it into the screen name cookie, and then look on the screen and I'll see the decrypted value of the remember me token, which is welcome Marcus and then some code numbers. So now I know what the right answer is for the administrator. Well, I just change it to admin and then let it encrypt it. And now I know the encrypted token to be the administrator because they used the same encryption routine for a high value target and a low value target. And I had access to one of them. This is how I decrypt um, obfuscated PHP malware a lot. Um, PH, because I can just run their code to decrypt it. I don't really have to understand it. I just find their decryptor and run it. Um, all right, so that's the game. I can now become admin. And in this case, they use strong, unbreakable encryption, but it didn't matter because I had access to an encryptor and a decryptor that I could get to. All right, so this is the thing you can do. Look for things that are encrypted, not hashed, and try substituting values back and forth and see if you can get away with these oh, things. You said cookie versus token. Uh, cookies. Like 60 is still cookie, right? um, well, a token is the general term for something that they use to identify you, and it could be stored in a cookie or it could be stored in something else, like a hidden parameter. But usually, it's stored in your cookie. But I mean, a token is a token, right? They can still store something in a token format, right? Or is it? Uh, well, no, no. You're thinking of no. serialization. You can store anything in a serialized format. A token is just a name for an identity card, typically a random-looking number, but not necessarily. Oh, like the last digits of that IP address. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you could call it a token. All right, so, and there's a password change function. So you go to change your password, and it asks you for your old password and your new password. This is the way it's usually done. However, um, if you, here's a, here's a catch-22. If you have separate code for the administrators and the users, then there will be bugs in one of them that aren't in the other. So all the best practices say never do that. It's even in your book for this class. It says have one identity provider, one authenticator to use for everything. Otherwise, you'll have this machine think you're the administrator, this machine think you're not the administrator. There should be one master thing like the domain controller, which decides who you are and everything else you just ask the domain controller. So if you apply that best practice here, what do you do when the administrator wants to reset your password because you forgot it? The administrator doesn't know your existing password. So there has to be an administrator version of this that runs without knowing your existing password. So the way they did it 
was they used the same code. And the code would look. And if you did not provide an existing password, that meant you were the administrator. Because that meant you're coming from the administrator form that doesn't ask for that. And that was the clue. So all you had to do was use Burp and go to the normal form and remove the existing password. And it would interpret you as the administrator and let you change the password. So it's an understandable mistake. And it's an attempt to follow a best practice, but a failed one. So that's the game. Just remove the existing password field entirely, and it will assume you must be the administrator. This is something many developers assume. They assume that the only way in is to use the forms they give you. So they give you a form that asks for existing password. They give the administrator form that doesn't. And when you get code without it, that means you must have come from that form because they don't know that you can use burp and forge the response to make it look any way you want. So that's the game. So try deleting parameters and see if you get different results when a parameter is gone, which is what we just did with SAML. Just removing the signature entirely got us in, whereas having the wrong signature would not have got us in. All right, and here's another one that happens a lot. You have a multi-stage process. You browse the product, you put things in the shopping basket, you go back here and finalize the order, enter payment information, then you enter delivery information. That's the way you should be doing shopping. And the administrator, of course, assumes that you do these things in order, but of course, you could just pay attention to the URL, put one up in your favorites. You could buy a product and put step four in your favorites, then go back and buy another product and jump directly to four without passing through steps two and three. And if the administrator didn't think of that, you're hosed. They call that forced browsing. Instead of clicking next, I jump to the other page. Another term for it is unsecured direct object reference, where you can go directly to something without proving that you should be there first. And that's the game. I proceed directly from step two to step four. I get the product without paying for it. Um, so you can try skipping stages, doing the same stage twice, doing stages backwards, and all these might have entertaining effects. Um, the right way to prevent this is to have a hidden parameter on each page that is set randomly by the server, and the next page should verify that that parameter is there. So that proves you must have come from the previous page this time and not from some memorized page that didn't have the right parameter. That's the right way to do it. But many people don't know that and they're open to this attack. So here's another one, there's an insurance provider. They will let this, I've seen the pages like this. I think the one Metro Mile has this. You can go there and they will estimate how much money you would save by switching to our insurance provider. So they have some kind of thing where you can make an account and you're not even a customer yet but you can tell them all your information and they'll predict like how much you should save and then hope you'll buy it later. So, um, all right. So this one here, you obtain quotes, then you have an application and the real application process is very stringent and you submit information, you file this personal details, it's sent to a human underwriter who investigates and decides your, if your finances are right and everything, and gives you a deal and that's fine. And so this is, that's the, the system of really getting insurance. The problem is, um, they didn't consider a user that would submit extra parameters. Since the underwriter used the same system as the person submitting the insurance, you can add the token that says the underwriter has already approved it. And they will interpret you as having already passed through that stage and you get in. So that's one trick. Um, purchase insurance at an arbitrary price, replace the monthly premium at later stages, and they think it's been approved because you put in the parameters to indicate the underwriter has already approved it. There were some examples like this in the previous chapter where we were doing funds transfer in a bank and they were able to add parameters to the request that said it had already been approved when it hadn't. So you can move parameters around from one stage to another and you might be able to have one stage where a parameter has a value and then change it in a later stage where it will assume the previous stage set. it. All right, here's another one. Bank customers can register for online banking. So this collects your name, address, and date of birth and forwards it to a backend system, which then mails you a paper thing, which is how my bank works too. I get this card in the mail. You can't do anything until you get this card in the mail because they want to be secure. So that's fine. The, the prop, they regarded this as very safe. Um, the one-time password is sent by mail, hard for someone to steal and all that jazz. Um, you have to call in and there's a data structure here stored in the database like this, first name, last name, customer number, and so on. The problem is um, online banking and registration uses the same data structure and the account details are generated this way. So what you can do is log in with valid credentials, go to the registration function and now submit a different customer's information and you can trick it into seeing somebody else's account. Um, anyway, 
That's the problem. You have one data mesh item that can be written to two different ways. One way where it happens after strict authentication and another one where you're registering for an account before you get the mailing, which applies to the same data structure, and this is not hard to do. Um, it's like that encryption function. It was used for a high value item and a low value item. It was the same function. You have the same data structure that can be written to in two different ways. You can also think of it as a matter of order. You do things in an unexpected order. So you don't go through this high security function before you come back here. Anyway, then there's beating a business limit. Um, this is a common one. You have some kind of limitation. You can only do transfer up to $10,000, nothing higher. Um, and then you have to get approval for that. So there's code like this. If amount less than the threshold, then it doesn't require approval. Otherwise, it requires approval. The problem is all you have to do is make the amount negative and it will never be greater than the threshold. The money will go in the other direction, but you can move larger amounts of money this way as long as they're negative. Um, this happens a lot. This happened um, in the mobile device class. We were talking about this. This happened in one of the vulnerabilities that let you forge Android permissions. All you had to do was put in a number that would be over roll over and be interpreted as negative in a links field and it would let you add data where you shouldn't be able to add data and change the permissions of your uh change the signature for your app so this is true of numeric limits this is also how a powh coin got hacked you could subtract money from an empty account and it could roll over and become a huge positive number and now you own all the money in the bank um, rollovers and negative numbers are a common problem integer overflow and integer underflow they call them they're serious problems so negative values at every step and very large values are an important thing to test because the computers are not very smart and numbers that get too large will just roll over back to zero and be interpreted as negative and things like that if the developer did not carefully watch the data types. And in languages like PHP and JavaScript, developers don't have to define the data type, so they often don't even know the data type or understand it. They just expect the number to be okay because it's okay as long as the number is not too large or too small, and they don't test these other values. So here's a common one, you order your software products and there are conditions under which you get a discount, like if you buy 10, it's cheaper. So all you have to do is put all 10 of them in your shopping basket, get the discount, and then delete the phone room, and you still keep the discount, because they didn't think of that. That's a common trick. Remember, there were a lot of these that went by, like the Microsoft was handing out USB flash drives for something, and there was a way to just like sign up over and over and over by like deleting the cookie or something. And this went all through um, those days, Yahoo chat and everything this was before Twitter. And Microsoft actually canceled the refund because people were getting like 100 of them. Um, anyway, so here's escaping from escaping. This one was pretty good. So they have user control input used to create an operating system command. But they didn't want to get hacked. So they filtered out special characters. So you can't put in a semicolon and add another command or an ampersand or greater than to redirect the output. So you should be fine, but they for, and they will do is add a backslash in front of these. And a backslash means it does not get treated as a meta character, but as a literal character. The problem is they didn't backslash, they didn't remove backslash itself. So now if I put in backslash semicolon, it backslashes out the semicolon, and the end result is it backslashes out the backslash and the semicolon takes effect. So this is the problem with blacklisting. If you try to stop all the evil characters, it is very often the case that there's still a way to hack it. It is much safer to do whitelisting, where you have a lone list of good characters and only those characters can get through nothing else. That is much safer than trying to think of every bad thing and block it. All right, and here's input validation. So a similar issue here, you got a SQL injection filter, which takes every quote and adds another quote to it, which is what SQL wants you to do. A double quote is treated as one literal quote, not as a meta character that ends a string. So that would be all right, but the problem is you also have a length limit that truncates input to 128 characters. So that means all you have to do is, um, so here's, if you try to inject this administrator, it will turn to this admin quote quote. And that will not cause a SQL injection. The quote, quote, we treat it as a literal quote in the name, and that's fine. But if you put in 127 A's and then an apostrophe, it will add another apostrophe and then trim it off because you exceed the length limit, and now you get a SQL injection. So your two layers of modification undo each other's work. And that is fundamentally what happens for almost all these attacks, 
is one layer of processing does something which causes the next layer of processing to misunderstand what's going on. All right, so that's the game. You can now create injections that are 127 characters long that let you in. All right, uh, if you want to detect this, you can try submitting just many, many quotes and see if there's any link of many quotes that cause the syntax error, for example, or other errors. Um, all right, and here's a search function. Uh, this is a fairly common arrangement. I've seen this quite a few times. Um, you have some kind of limited thing where you're supposed to prove you've logged in before you can access something or prove you paid for it before you access something. But once you've done that, it just has a link. Uh, this is something Kirk used to find. We had these um, Microsoft software deals where you could download software. And he kept finding out that you could just log in, find the software link, save the link, and now just email the link to somebody. Everybody can just download the stuff. Because Microsoft's distribution system did not have authentication. It's through whole unsecured direct object reference. Once you log in, they give you the URL, but they don't actually check who you are when you click the URL. So you can pick a copy on another website and everybody can just download it. Um, of course, in Microsoft's case, this wasn't too much of a, a problem because you also needed a product key. And they would generate the product key by a more secure process. So it was just a way to get the software if you lost your copy of it. But still, it showed the same kind of thing. And here's what happened here. Um, this one was the even more subtle one, though. You can, you can search the product before paying for it. And you can search inside the contents of the product before paying for it. So that means you could, in fact, deduce what's in the content by searching. So you can, this is like blind SQL injection. If you can do any question, then you could find things. Like press release, you could do WAH consulting, WAH consulting, merger, share issue, guess what the content might have and see if you have a match. So you can, in principle, reconstruct it. Uh, there are database vulnerabilities like this. Um, there are a series of these where you can have information leak from a high security privileged database to an unprivileged attacker who can just guess until they find it. Uh, in a sense, this is what Spectre and Meltdown were. Spectre and Meltdown let you guess for something and see if it's already in the cache. So you cannot directly access something because you don't have permission, but you can indirectly figure out what it is by guessing. Anyway, uh, people have done this to reinforce a password with things like this. Password is A, password is B, and this is what blind sequel injection is. You guess one letter until you find it right, then you guess the next letter, and you gradually build information about a secret. All right. Uh, Error messages are often a big problem. You may notice my servers have a lot of ugly error messages when you do the project. I turned on PHP error messages just so we can see them. You have them turned off on production servers because they often contain too much information. So here's a new app, which is buggy, and it prints out all this information about the currently logged in user. And they thought that would be okay because you'll only see your own information. So what doesn't really matter if I see your cookie and so on, all the parameters you sent the server, but the problem is um, the error message was, came from a stored container on the server side, which was not tied to your session. This is another one of these um, in, unsecured direct object access kind of things where it doesn't tie everything to the session. So if there's an error condition, it copies it to a container and then lets you see that container. But if two users have the same error at the same time, they both copy the same container. The container is not tied to your session. If you use modern versions of Linux, you will find that there's a bunch of subfolders in the temp folder. And every app that writes to the temp folder is writing to its own subfolder. So you cannot hit the same data that some other app put in the temp folder for this reason, because this was such a common problem. One app writes something in a temp folder, another app, or another thread of the same app in a multi-user environment writes to the same thing, and now you see somebody else's stuff. I've seen reports. And students have told me they've seen it too, where someone sees somebody else's Gmail or somebody else's Yahoo mail. This happens rarely, but it happens when things get busy. It gets confused and shows you somebody else's stuff. And that means somebody made this mistake. Every page you look at is not really tied to your session. Some page is shared and somebody else's data got in there instead of yours. So that's what happened here. Um, and so that's the race condition. Where under certain conditions, you'll see somebody else's stuff. But what's even worse is you could now just pull that constantly. I could keep on polling to see if I get that error, and I might get a list of information I can use to hack into things. Um, so that's the bug. 
And of course, uh, this is very hard to debug because if you set up the server and then test it, you won't see anything. It only happens when it's really busy, so busy that two users are using it at the same time and you probably don't have a test condition like that. So you'll write it, test it, say it's okay, then you deploy it, then people complain, then you take it down and test it and it looks okay. It's the kind of thing that can drive you nuts. All right, so here's the problem. At some point you're storing something in a variable that is not tied to your session, that's shared by other people, and in a high volume condition, this causes it to get confused about who you are. That's called a race condition, where there is two processes running, and if you win the race, you hack it. There's a brief period of time when you can do what you should not be able to do. This happens all the time. And I wrote a project doing one in another class. If you take 127, you'll do it. This is very easy to set up a condition with a race condition where you can elevate to administrator because there's a brief period of time when some process is running as administrator and you can change something in that time. So to all these logic flaws, um, what you really need to do is, it's not technically, you need to make a flow chart, like an organization diagram. You do this step, you do this step. This is why I keep saying managers are necessary and managers should not attempt to be technical. You don't get into the code. You say, all right, tell me what information did you collect? You got the user's name, you got their address, you got the social security, okay, where did you put it? How did you make sure nobody's getting at it? This, it can be a block diagram. Where did it go? Where did you put it? When did you delete it? You'll catch this kind of thing just by seeing the flow of how the data came in and where it went out. And it's, um, all right, that's the game. You should have clear documentation and have some, so at some level, there should be a level where you have a block diagram and you understand where the data is, where it's being stored, where it's being sent. Somebody has to do that. Like you'd have a plumber watch all the places the water goes and see if it's leaking out somewhere. They'll see if there's a, a leak that way. And this will be a security review process. Uh, you can focus on conditions that the user can control. That would be a way to hit most of the high value problems quickly. All right, so think about the ways it handles unexpected user behavior. That's why you need people with what they call the hacker mindset. There's a certain kind of people that are always making trouble. Um, I remember I went to a convention. Yeah, I went to a convention and I was I got a day early, so I walked up to uh, Subway to buy a sandwich. And I asked the woman behind the counter. I said, "Why is the security camera pointing over there? It should be pointing to the cash register or the door." And she wouldn't sell me a sandwich. She said, well, "You're a crook. You're planning to rob the place." I said, "Well, no. That's just the first thing that came to my mind." I'm a security professional, and she wouldn't sell me a sandwich. She made me leave. I was I felt offended. But you need that's the thing about hackers. You need these people that think of what is the twisted backwards thing to do in this case, and what would happen if I did that. Troublemakers. Anyway, all right. So that's uh, that's that chapter, and we've had other things happen. I think that's enough for one day. Unless people have questions. Yeah. Do you recommend going to DEF CON? Oh yeah. Uh, yes. DEF CON is very good. Um, now, to be fair, DEF CON is huge, like Disney World. There's 25,000 people. There's 50 villages and contests and everything. So you can have a bad experience. You could go to a talk you can't understand, go to some. So don't let that happen. If you go to a talk and you don't like it, just walk out and go somewhere else. I highly recommend the villages. The villages are like small conventions inside the convention, and they're much more friendly. The lockpick village is always swarm. There's a car hacking village, a biohacking village. It, it costs about 300 bucks to get in, but um, yeah, I do highly recommend DEF CON. A lot of, you can have a very good experience there. Just be aware that you know it's up to you to have a good experience. Like go to Disneyland, you ride a ride you don't like, you're miserable. Uh, that doesn't mean it's all bad. I like RSA. Yeah, well, if you like RSA, um, then you might like DEF CON. RSA is much less exciting than DEF CON, much less technical. But you know, if maybe that's the thing. If you, as long as you understand what it is and you can read up about it, there's tons of cool things to do. Um, there's late night parties that are sort of hard to get into with people doing expensive things and strippers and stuff. But there's also a lot of show in the day. You know, there's people there doing wild Vegas partying. Some people are into that. I'm not. But um, there's also an awful lot of good talks and an awful lot of good demonstrations in the villages. I always hang out in the packet hacking village. I know those guys, I, I, I can do hands-on training. There. So, but um, there's lots of things to do there. You should be able to find something fun. Anything else? All right, I'm gonna stop the share and I'll go upstairs and help anybody wants to work on projects. <laughs>